Hi and welcome to the page. I'm Ken Smith and today we are going to take a walk around this amazing Jeep. Now this just isn't any old normal World War II Jeep. This Jeep was made by Ford Motor Company. That's right. So this Model A owner is getting a chance to walk around this Ford Jeep. We're going to meet the owner, so let's take a walk. My name is Jeff Campbell. I'm a World War II reenactor and I'm here with my 1942 Ford GPW. Uh, this was one of the first production run that Ford made for the U.S. military. Uh, this is known as a Ford script. If you want to step back here, you'll be able to see that large Ford logo. In that first production run, uh, Ford had stamped that, as did Willis with their first production run. After that, it's my understanding that the military said, hey, it's not a billboard, stop doing that. So that's why you can't distinguish one from the other. But this one was made by Ford. Uh, this Jeep itself was, uh, delivery date was May 8th, 1942. It was made um, in Louisville, Kentucky. So what are some of the uh, unique uh, qualities of this? For example, um, I see that you've got I see that you've got rubber boots in here. Exactly, yes. And what makes those different than later later Jeeps that I've seen with like uh, leather boots? Well, the early Jeeps like this were produced when they still had rubber at their disposal, and so naturally they had used the rubber for the boots. Um, later there was the rubber shortage, and they changed to those leather boots, and that's why. Uh, another interesting difference, uh, during wartime there was a, like I said, the rubber was in short supply, so therefore this Jeep, being one of the original, that first production run, had foam rubber seats. Later they switched to a horsehair mat that they used, once again because foam rubber, the rubber was not available. Um, interesting, I guess, this Jeep also, some of the other little nuances would be this one came with a small filler neck, which I'm guessing the idea is, you know, if you're pulling up to a gas station with a pump, that would be fine, but when you're, you know, taking it out of, you know, 50 gallon drums and so for someone in the field, it's much harder, so therefore they went to a larger filler neck later. Uh, another example is the key switch. A lot of people see that key switch and think, oh, that's a reenactorism. Well, no, it's actually not. Uh, the first production run actually had key switches, and then the military probably thought better of that and get away with it. So then, as far as uh, the way it's outfitted, um, I'm assuming that this is uh, a replica M1? That is correct. Okay. Yes, actually. You know, just, just an example, since I am a reenactor, mine has not been restored to the, like, just rolling off the assembly line effect. Uh, I use mine just like she's been in the field, so therefore it, it, it stays more of an in-the-field condition, so it does have some of the accoutrement that you might have added, you know, uh, a soldier in the field, just a little modifications. Say, for instance, you know, uh, copied from, you know, kind of a cavalry uh, um, um, scabbard, I guess, would that be the term? Sure. But anyway, another example of that would be the, uh, this is an English hunting flask, so another modification, not necessarily, I guess, approved by the military, but let's say it may have happened, okay? <laughs> You know, for medicinal purposes. Of sure, course, absolutely. Of yeah, that's a, that's a, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So anyway, um, such as this, actually, uh, you know, captured German weaponry. Uh, the, the idea being on that would be Fritz lost this, and if we find him, we're gonna give it back to him. So. Yeah. Okay. So ammo box? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And is that actually a period correct ammo box? That is a period correct ammo box. Uh, that would be the uh, basically for that 30 carbine, which would be exactly you know the, the, the what's mounted there on the side. What they actually used was. And then what about as far as the uh, the engine goes? What type of of engine would be inside this? Well, this one actually does have the Ford GPW motor. Okay. You take a look at that. That'd be awesome. One other feature you may be interested in, which I always found quite interesting. When you first look at this, you think it would basically just be for headlight adjustment. This was, I thought, a very innovative design in that you now have war lights. Oh, Both of them wow. flip up and now at night, you know, in, in dark conditions, ingenious. you have work lights. You got work lights right up until the time the battery goes down. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. 
That is way, way, way cool. Another feature that I don't know how familiar most people are, but these are what are known as combat rims. Obviously, you notice the lug bolts, but see these bolts here? Yes. This is essentially a two-piece construction. Not a split rim, but similar. It's two pieces put together. Um, so that way, instead of having to wrench, you know, tire iron to try to get this tire off, uh -huh. take them apart. There's a large, what looks like a huge rubber band that goes in between to keep it, you know, from pinching. So right. for someone wants you to put your tube back in. But basically, you take that apart, slap on a new tire, put them back, sandwich them back together, boulder up, ready on to go. On the road to go. Way cool. So is this a uh, constant four-wheel drive? Yeah. No. No, no, no. So just like... Uh, Kind of like your modern Jeeps today. Exactly. Well, uh, the one thing that's different is people often uh, question, they'll look inside and they'll say, why are there three yeah. levers? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. obviously the large, you know, tallest one, of course, is your gear shift. Yeah. Standard three uh, speeds. Um, this one is to engage your transfer fence. Okay. okay. As far as to engage it, then there is the high or low range once she's engaged. Okay. You don't essentially have a two-wheel low. You know, basically you're taking you either once she's engaged, then you've got a high and low option. Gotcha. Transfer case itself. And I'm I I just got to know. Sure. Yeah. Are these bullet casings? Uh, yes, as a reenactor. <laughs> yeah, as a reenactor, um, that means I that I probably had someone had shooting had over or around the Jeep. Yeah, I didn't see those. That actually happened. <laughs> and and to be honest, I yeah, find that even when I do pull them out and give them to kids, they're kind of like yeah. beach sand. You never get rid of all of them yeah. as you drive around. Yeah. Well, another one rolls out from someplace else. Where so it's this stuck. probably happened up in Ohio. <laughs> exactly. That is a Conneaut. I'm sure those are you know something for Conneaut. Way cool. All right. This was the Flathead Ford. Uh, this basically uh, engine is still a six volt system. Uh, it's my understanding that it's actually one of the first negative grounds that Ford made. By the way, that was since that was the military contract. And I guess the original design had a negative ground. Um, that Ford had to produce a negative ground for this model as well. Uh, you'll notice a lot of grounding straps. That seems to be the key from what I understand with my limited, limited uh, mechanical knowledge. The key to having a six volt system crank the way it should is the grounding straps because obviously you have six volts versus 12. So um, you'll notice that there are grounding straps pretty much everywhere. Even the fuel line has a grounding strap on it. So what about um, as far as interchangeability with uh, Ford and Willys? Uh... Complete, exactly. Uh, they, like I said, it was designed um, essentially started as a long story as far as the design, but basically the three companies that produced them were Ford, Willis, and Bantam that produced the prototypes. And it was essentially the Willis version that was chosen by the military, partly because of the engine, which was known as a go devil engine. Uh, it had the power that they needed because Ford and Bantam both had tried to use smaller motors to stay within the weight restrictions that the government had given them. Uh, Willis just barely made it yeah, the under camp. the wire yeah. with its weight yeah, requirements well, the using a larger the engine, the but in testing the prototypes they realized that underpowered it was useless, yeah. so they went it with the larger the engine and basically there were you know several things that they liked, I guess more about the Willis prototype. But even as I used it as an example earlier, this iconic Jeep grill that you know we're all used to seeing so for someone, the original Willis versions are known as a slack grill and they had these welded steel bars. I think there were ten of them, if I'm not mistaken, but anyway, they were welded steel bars, welded across the top, welded across the bottom, and that was their grill. Ford said, we're not a welding company, we're a stamping company. So they did that, and the government said, yes, let's do that. So it was somewhat of a collaborative effort between the companies. They did take certain design features and use them, not just Willis, you know, uh, exclusively. Um, as, you, as you'll notice, you were asking about Ford versus Willis as far as the difference. The interchangeability is there, definitely. But if you can see closely on this, there is an F right there, a cursive F there on the fender. Uh, if you look closely at some of the original bolt heads, there is a cursive F. Right. And on the back of the seat, you can still see. Ford F stamped pretty much every part because that was their way of identifying whether they manufactured or Willis manufactured. And how many um, 
How many of these do you think were made? Uh, during World War II, there were roughly 650,000 made. Uh, Ford was responsible uh, for 280, uh, excuse me, 278,000, I believe. Yeah, almost so Ford 280, made a good, yeah. good chunk, almost, almost 280,000. Yeah, yeah, that's that's quite a bit. So how did you acquire this? Um, I actually had a client in my particular business that uh, her husband was a World War II reenactor, and he was selling it. She said, well, I know you do World War II. Would you be interested? And that's how it happened. And so how long have you had it now? I think you uh, this is my seventh year, about six and a half, seven years. Nice, nice. And where do you do all your reenacting at? Uh, all over. Uh -huh. uh, we, we pretty much throughout the southeast. Uh, I just got back from a big event that's the uh, largest D-Day reenactment. Yep, in, uh, up in Ohio. Yeah, yeah Conneaut just did that a couple weeks ago. Uh, yeah. I was fortunate enough to actually be able to travel to Normandy and was part of that 75th uh, D-Day uh, commemoration that they had there in, in Normandy. Nice, nice, nice. You name it, I'll, I'll drag something there and go. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So, uh, this is just absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for just spending a little time with me and telling me a little bit about this amazing vehicle. Me being a Ford Model A owner, I was intrigued the moment I heard that this was this was made by Ford because this is the first time I've actually ever seen yeah. one. Oh, wow. So I was really, really Lamb impressed to see this. So. Well, I understand there's a lot of similarities and a lot of parts that you would recognize very similar as far as this is how the top attaches. I understand there's some early Ford, you know, uh, similarities from uh -huh. what I understand. Yeah, so... Thanks again, and I so appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your interest. I really want to thank Jeff for doing such an impromptu video. We were actually down here with the Model A Club during Heritage Days in Jonesboro, and Jeff was kind and gracious enough to allow me to do this impromptu interview. So I really want to thank him again personally. Please remember to like and subscribe. So important to us, but most of all, be blessed.